Well, church, we are in Romans 11 this morning. So turn with me to Romans 11, and we're going to finish uh, chapter 11 of Romans. And uh, this, is, this is a more difficult text to understand, um, especially when you start asking questions of what this means and what this means. And, and then after uh, Paul gives this, this, this great text explaining the depths of God's sovereign plan of salvation for Jew and Gentile, he breaks out into this praise of God for, oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments. He praises God for all of uh, the, the, the depth of who he is. And then after that, you get into this applicable, popular Romans 12. Therefore, it's like a kind of a shift uh, in the focus of Romans the first 11 chapters are what I like to call an apologetic for the gospel. Uh, it, it is a defense of the gospel. It's an explanation of the gospel, but it's also a defense. Any question that could possibly be raised against the gospel, Paul brings up in the first 11 chapters. I really can't think of anything else. And then here, right towards the end, we're dealing with ethnic Israel still and the Gentiles and how this all works uh, and... Really what Paul is saying here at the end of chapter 11 is something that we all would be wise to apply to our lives and that is it's not about you and it's not about me. Life, this life that we live, it's not about me and it's not about you. And if we raise our kids to believe that and own that in a healthy way, that life is about the glory of God. Yes, God loves you, and he died for you, and he created you for a great purpose, but the purpose is not you at the end. That's not, the finish line is not for, for you to get what you want. The finish line is to run this race for the glory of God. That's the goal in life. Uh, I saw something on Facebook not too long ago, probably a couple years ago, where it was like a mother and a child walking on the beach, and the, and the child asked, Mom, what is the purpose of life? And the mother said, You are. And I was just like, and everybody just loved that, that, that post. And I just thought, Oh, I just want to, I just get a little sick when I see that, because that is not what life is about. And when we live for our own glory, we really mess things up. We do. If you really think about it, all of sin comes out of that. I want what I want, and I don't care how it affects someone else or how it, how it offends God. I want what I want. That is where sin comes from. So we need to embrace that, and that's really what Romans 11 is all about. It, it, it's teaching us and reminding us that, the, that life is not about us. It's about the glory of God. When I built my koi pond, I didn't build my koi pond for the koi pond. I built it for me to enjoy. I created it. You know, I, it reflects my creativity. I would say my expertise, but really I got that from someone else, from Jeff Rashi. He taught me how to do all of it, right? But, but, but it was, I was building it for me to enjoy, for my kids to enjoy, and it reflects a little bit of who I am. And that's really how we are. God created us to reflect him and to, to be enjoyed by him and for us to display his glory. That's what we are created for. For him to be pleased and glorified. Not that he is needy, that he is a needy God. In fact, he's existed for all of eternity. In fact, he says here that he didn't need anything. He didn't create us to, to need anything. He wasn't a needy God who was given a gift to him that he might be repaid. Like God doesn't need us, but he created us because that's who he is. He creates. And he creates us to reflect him and to glorify him and to live for him. And when we do that, there is that perfect balance. That is how life is supposed to be. So we find the meaning and the purpose of life and we fit into that created order that God had ordained for us to be. That's really what this is about. He starts out with the, the, the first statement. Lest you be wise in your own sight. Lest you be wise in your own sight. 
All of the points that we're going we're gonna, to uh, investigate here at the end of chapter 11 go back to that. Be careful lest you be wise in your own sight. Last week we talked about the dangers of pride and how pride is one of the most, uh, uh, most pet, it pests, it, it's just, it just, never leaves us. It's just always there. It's always wanting to, to raise up its ugly face in, in our lives. And it's the hardest thing to kill. It's pesky. It's annoying. And so God knows this. And so he tells us here in his word, especially when it comes to salvation. He's talking about salvation here and redemption. Lest you be wise in your own sight about what? About our salvation. About the fact that we are God's child. You know, we can make religion, Christianity can become about us more than it's about God. Even our salvation become about me patting myself on the back and I'm pretty good. So he attacks that. And he, and he attacks it by explaining the sovereignty of God in salvation. Lest you be wise in your own sight. Did you know that Identity formation, human identity formation, naturally comes from comparing to others. I read a book for grad school. It was like this big. It was one of the most difficult books I, I read. And the whole first part of it is all about how people uh, form their social identity and their personal identity based on interactions with other people. And it was a lot of actually secular writings that was explaining how that happens. And then, and then looking at the New Testament through how, how the, the, our new identity is, is formed and what, what Jesus is trying to teach us about this new identity that we have in Christ. That we don't compare ourselves to people, but we compare ourselves to God and we look to God and that is our standard, not other people. And so... Uh, it's normal and natural for us to compare ourselves to other people. In fact, you think of it, we do it with, with our neighbors. We do it with coworkers. We do it with people uh, uh, of other ethnicities. We do it with people who think differently and vote differently than us. It's us versus them a lot of times. And we, we tend to like look down on people or talk negatively or think negatively so that we can bolster ourselves up. It was very interesting as I studied this book to realize, man, we do this so much and many times I don't think we even realize that we do it. And it actually keeps us imprisoned from really finding what our true identity was meant to be as a created being from God Almighty with a purpose to seek Him, to know Him, and then to see him fashioned in us and to realize that I do not have it figured out, that I am not perfect and I have a lot of growth to do. So comparing to other people doesn't matter, but comparing to Christ, comparing to God, comparing to the, the God-man who walked this earth, Jesus, God incarnate, that perfect example, that's what I look to. That's what I want to seek. And so that's what, he is getting at here, lest you be wise in your own sight. I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion and he will banish ungodliness from Jacob and this will be my covenant with them. When I take away their sins. As regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as regards to election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments 
and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him, through him, and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. So I want to break this down a little bit here, okay? First, starting out, don't be wise in your own sight. Why? A couple points. When the fullness of Gentiles come into God's family, the nation of Israel will be brought back. That's crystal clear here in verse 25 through verse 26. This was especially applicable to the people of this time, to the Gentiles, because the Gentiles as a whole did not like the Jews. The Jews were annoying to them. And if you can, you can see this in how they mock Jesus when, when he is going through trial. Do you remember how they put the crown of thorns on his head? Why did they put the crown of thorns on his head? Was it to cause physical pain? That was a part of it, but it was more than that. It was actually a lot more than that. It was to mock him. It was like, Oh, king of the Jews, hail king of the Jews. They put a thorn crown on his head and then they mocked him and laughed about it and it was just hilarious to them because to them, the Jews were a joke. That was their thinking. That's why they did it. They were making fun of the Jewish people. And so now you have all these Gentiles coming in to God's family and being grafted in and adopted into God's family and it'd be very natural for them to, to start doing the natural human thing of pushing down the Jews and making them feel like they're pretty big and bad. Like I'm, I'm pretty good, you know, like those Jews are self-righteous, you know, all about the law. You know, look, they could never get, the, get God's grace by the law. What were they thinking? It was very easy for people to do that. And so this kind of crushes that. It's saying, listen, when, when all the Gentiles from every nation and tribe, every ethnicity, Jesus says that, when, when the gospel goes out to all of uh, the nations, to all the world, then the end will come. Okay, so once all the Gentiles come in, I talked to a buddy of mine who, who is a... Uh, uh, head of the Moody Aviation Department this last week, and I asked him, so how many more tribal groups still need to be reached? And he says, it's in the thousands. The thousands. When, when you look at the word every tribe, tongue, and nation, it's speaking, those words, it's speaking of ethnicity. So there may be small tribes in Brazil, other parts of the world that have never received the gospel, and they may not be like a nation like the United States, but they are an ethnicity. And so that is why missions organizations, they have their goal to reach every tribe. That's their goal. America used to be really, really good at sending out missionaries. We're really, really struggling with that. We're, we're falling back. There's actually other countries that are, that are outdoing us in that. South Korea would be one. But we really have not been doing that great of a job like we used to. And so this is what this text is saying. Once all the Gentiles are reached, now, there's a, there's a lot of debate on that. Okay, does that happen before the rapture? Before the tribulation? Or does that happen, actually, does some of this happen during the tribulation? So the end will come. Is the end like the beginning of the end or is it the end end? So there's a lot of debate on that, and I don't really know for sure. Just leave that out there for you to think about. But for us, it's probably best to think before the rapture. I want to get it done now. Let's get to work. Let us reach the lost. Let the church send out missionaries. I talked to somebody, um, you know, this last week, and I hear this often, uh, like that a lot of people are against organized religion. And I always ask the question, okay, so what is organized religion? I get it that Christians aren't perfect and there's a lot of problems and the church has its issues, but organized religion from the biblical perspective should be that we are devoted to the preaching of the word. We are devoted to the public preaching of the word, to fellowship, to communion. That is organized religion and that is what God wants us to be doing. We want to be devoted to that. And then to reaching the lost, 
to worshiping in psalms and spiritual hymns, and then to going out into the world and reaching the lost. And so the church should be supporting missionaries, which is why we had a missionary just recently, the Gonermans from Japan, come and share. And we're able to support and see what they're doing in Japan. And Japan is a a, a country that is very much unreached. So the church should be about that today, reaching the world with the gospel. So this church is a part of that. We're not the only ones, obviously, in the city, all over the city and all over our country, churches are doing that. And I am so thankful that we get to be a part of that. And then Israel will be grafted back in. If you read through Revelation, it's, uh, it's an awesome picture of how that's actually going to happen. There's a lot of mystery in it. Come behold the wondrous mystery, right? There's a lot of mystery. But there's going to be these two witnesses that go throughout the whole world. I preached on Revelation uh, about probably almost two years ago. And, and there's going to be these two witnesses, and there's a lot of debate on those two witnesses, whether it's, it's Elijah, you know, and, um, and if I can remember correctly, I think it was Elijah and, and Moses, but then there's, there's other pictures of the law and the prophets, and then there's other pictures. I think Donna has one. What was the other one? Enoch. Yep, Enoch was taken up, so the whole, the whole focus of that was that that's uh, pointed for man once to die and then to face judgment. Well, Enoch didn't die, so it's going to be Enoch. So there's all this debate on that. Um, and, and it's, but it's very interesting. But here's the, here's the key. is it, it, Those witnesses are especially for Israel. And so Israel is going to be coming back in in droves. And, and many other people as well. And that's what he's saying here. He's like, listen, guys, God has still got a plan for Israel, so you better be careful that you don't boast over Israel and start to look down on the Jewish people. And sadly, Christianity over the centuries has done that at times. And that should never be the case. Because if we truly have come to Christ in humility, there is no room to boast. There is no room to look down on Israel. There's no room, us as Christians, to look down on pagan America. Like, we can call out the sin that's in pagan America. We can say that's wrong, but we should also have grace in that and realizing that if it weren't for Christ, I would be just as lost. So we have to be careful that we don't look, we don't be wise in our own sight. And you know what? The only one that truly knows that is you and God. And sometimes not even you. It's mainly God. But if you allow God to search your heart, he'll show you when you're being wise in your own sight. So that's the first point. Why not be wise in your own sight? Because, guys, Israel's going to be grafted back in. This is giving us a picture of the future. This is prophetic here, this statement. Then, secondly, Israel. There are enemies, yet beloved, and still called as a nation. You see, God is still got a heart for Israel, and that's why Jewish people are coming to know Christ today. I had a friend who was a missionary in Israel. I hadn't heard from him in 15 years because he was about God's work in Israel for 15 years. And then eventually, the higher-ups got wind of what he was doing and trying to reach the Jewish people with the gospel, and they kicked him out of the country. And he said it it was just devastating for them because they had all these relationships. They raised their kids there and it was really, really hard for them. But that was his, and he, he told me about stories of Jewish people coming to know Christ, but it's very much like, it's very much underground. And that's what's going on right now in Israel. So God is still calling Israel to himself, and eventually Israel as a nation, as a whole, is going to respond to the gospel and be brought back in. And you know what? It's not too different in how he has called you and I. He is patient with us, just like he was patient with Israel. How long did it take for him to call you? How patient has God been with you? For me, I came into Christ as a young kid, but I didn't really, really understand all that the gospel entails. God was patient with me and is still patient with me through all my weaknesses and constantly working on me, that is what he does. It is this constant regeneration that is happening in my life. Colossians 1 is a good one to go to to kind of show how we're not that different than Israel. 21, Colossians 1, starting verse 21, and you 
who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Wow. We were enemies of God. You catch that? Enemies doing evil deeds, alienated from God, just as Israel. Enemies, yet called as a nation. You were an enemy. I was an enemy of God, even though we didn't even realize it, probably. Many people don't even realize they're an enemy of God. But if you are not about the purposes of God, and you're about your own purposes, if you're like that little kid on the beach and the mom, what's life all about? It's about you. You are an enemy of God. That is the direct opposite of what we were created to be. So we all have been enemies of God and he has patiently drawn us towards himself, reconciled us and presents us holy and blameless before a perfect holy God. So we are no different than Israel. That is what Paul is getting at here. Next, this is probably the hardest part of this text for me, probably for you as well. In verse 32, It says that God consigned all to disobedience so to have mercy on all. What does that mean? A couple questions I want to ask. One, what does it mean that God consigned all? Consigned. What does that mean? Probably a good way to interpret that word consigned is he gave us over. And in giving us over, we actually became bound We became imprisoned to our sin. So why would God give us over? Go back to Romans 1, verse 21 through 24. That's why it's always good to go into the context, the first the immediate context, and then um, the whole context of Romans, and then the whole context of Scripture. Romans 1, verse 21, he explains this in depth. For although... They knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. Now, of course, this comes right out of they can look at creation and know that there is a God. So everyone knows that there is God. It's a natural thing for us to do. But because of sin, it's also natural for us to reject God and turn from him. And so they knew God, but they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile into their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, and here's the key phrase, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. So, He consigned, he gave us up to what we wanted in our hearts and that was to get God out. That's what has happened throughout the entire world and that is what's wrong with the entire world. He gave us up and gave us what we wanted. So how does this apply to us? Well, we'll get to that in a little bit. Another question I have is, Who is the all? All. He says he gave all so that all might be, he might have mercy on all. So does that, what does that mean? He might have mercy on all. There's three uh, views of this. Some believe this is referring to universal salvation. Universal salvation, which is not congruent with scripture, but you could take that one text and, and, and think that way. In fact, uh, J.C. O'Neill, a late theologian, said that God leaves no one outside of his love and care and eventually all will be saved. Now, that would be a pleasant thought to think that all will be saved, but it does not go with the whole of Scripture. And so we cannot accept that, um, that interpretation of this one phrase that would be taking that out of context. Now, there's two other, two other uh, options here. Some believe Albert Schweitzer is one. Theologian Albert Schweitzer believe that this is referring to only the elect. As Paul is speaking of the saved 
Gentile, through God's mercy, and the Jew being grafted and receiving mercy. It is all the elect of God, the chosen of God, the predestined. And that would go along with the context because if you remember Romans 8, we're told that, that he has predestined us, that he foreknew us. So is it speaking of the elect, all the elect? And then the third view by some, one being Bill Mounts, believe Paul is referring to all ethnicities. No one can lay claim, this is what Bill Mount says, no one can lay claim on the mercy of God. It is a free gift for all who believe, regardless of ethnic background or ethical performance. Now, I, I lean towards that viewpoint because I think that especially fits with the context of what is going on here in Romans. He's talking about ethnicities. He's talking about Gentiles. He's talking about Jews. He's trying to help them not have this racial superiority towards someone else based on the, the, the natural human way of, of, of personal and social identity formation. He's trying to get them past that into recognizing that all tribes and tongues and nations will be brought into God's family. Even those, the Jewish nation who was grafted out, God still has promises that stand for them and they are irrevocable. That word irrevocable is um, clear in this text in verse 29. So it is, I think, speaking of all ethnicities so that he may have mercy on all Regardless of their ethnicity, that is God's plan. And it's a beautiful plan because as we talked about last Sunday with, remember that tree that had all those different branches grafted in? It's a beautiful picture and it, it displays a glory that you go, who did that? I want to know who did that. That is what God is doing. And so when we go into heaven someday, we're going to see this beautiful display of humanity worshiping God. And you talk about exciting. I don't know if you've ever been in a big event where people are worshiping Christ and it's power. It, is, it just gives you goosebumps. Especially when it's all different types of people. All different ethnicities. Praising the same God. We're all, you know why it's exciting? Because I think all of us deep down want unity, but our sinful nature keeps us from unifying. We just, because of that, that, that insecurities that, that exist in us and it's not fair and what about this group of people and, and they got it better than us back then and so we need to have it better now, whatever. We just have a real hard time having unity but deep down we want it and someday there's gonna be perfect unity in heaven because God is king and we're gonna praise him and we're gonna be unified because of him. That's the beauty of it. It's all going to be brought together and we're going to say, that's what God has done. We couldn't do it. Man, we really screwed things up, didn't we? Do you remember when we were in this broken world and we we're always fighting over black and white and Asian and all of these problems that we had and, and even, even, you know, at different tribal groups fought against each other. We always find a way to fight. But God has brought us together and it's all taken care of. And we stand before the throne of God, blameless, praising him for what he has done. That is so exciting to me. And that's what I believe he's saying here. God has allowed for us to have what we want. He, he has given us free will. He has ordained for that. It's his perfect plan. Why did God allow for us the third question? So that he could have mercy. Because if we didn't have free will... And we weren't given over to our free will and given over to sin. Adam was given free will and he chose him and Eve their own way. They chose their own way, even in a perfect place. So it shouldn't surprise us that us being born of Adam with the same blood of Adam, being born into a world that is much more broken than it was when Adam was, was on this uh, before the fall, that we are even more prone to disobedience We've got temptations everywhere. And so we all, like sheep, have gone astray. And the Lord has allowed us so that he could then redeem us and show his mercy and grace, which we would have no clue what that even looks like if he didn't give us free will in the first place. So he did it to be who he is. To be who he is. If 
God did not have the plan the way we see in Scripture, we would not have a clue. If he would have made us all robots, I had a friend, an atheist friend of mine. He's not an atheist anymore, thank the Lord. But he, he said, I just think that free will, it would be best if we didn't have any free will whatsoever and God just made us robots to serve him. Because look at all the brokenness in this world. Look at all the evil that happens. Why didn't God just make us just eh, do this, you know, from the, and never have any chance to turn against him? And, and the only way I can think of that is, is that really God would not have been able to exercise his attributes of grace and mercy and agape love. He never would have been able to exercise that if there wasn't this plan for there to be us given the choice and then turn from him, all of us, and then him bring us back through his great mercy. So, I see that, uh, that that is why he did it. He did it so that he could have mercy and he did it because it is his perfect plan. That's really the answer. He did it because of, that he could demonstrate his mercy and because it's his perfect plan. And then after all of that, all of that, he says, oh, the depths. Now, after you get through that, I think that's a fitting thing to say. Your mind kind of gets get blown away a little bit like oh this is just crazy how this all is working together and how God is using even our hardness of heart to display his mercy and his glory and he says oh the depths of the riches and the knowledge of God three rhetorical questions who knows the mind of the Lord nobody nobody can even scratch the surface we're talking about a God who created the entire universe. Have you ever been around a really, really smart person in their field and you just feel really stupid? I have. Like the first time I met Jeff Rashi and he's explaining to me all this stuff about koi ponds, I'm just like, whoa. Like, okay, slow down. Let's write. You need to write this stuff down because I'm not going to remember any of it, right? You, you, and, and here's God who created life. Created the entire universe. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Nobody. Who has been his counselor? Who has given God advice? We need advice all the time. God has never needed any advice. Oh, the depths. Who gives to him like he actually needed it? Nobody. Another rhetorical question. He truly, God, is holy other. He is the supreme king of kings that is separated from us in a way that just causes us to fall on our knees and worship. And that is what this is all about. For from him and through him and to him are all things. All things were created by him. All things were created good at the beginning. If you remember, if God created everything, it was good, it was good, it was good. And he created mankind. He said, it was very good. God wants us to know that that was the original design so that John, when Jesus steps on the stage, he brings us back to the beginning. He says, in the beginning was the word. Christ was in the very beginning and through him comes life and light. God, Jesus brings us back to the beginning when everything was good. The first time since Adam that somebody had walked this earth with no sin in them was in Jesus. And so it goes back to the beginning. But I ask this question. Okay, so if God created everything, if all things are from him, through him, and to him, we we'll beg the question, so where does evil come from? Did God create evil? If all things are created by him and through him and to him, where did evil come from? And I would ask first this question. Can you have a jar of evil? Is there such a thing as like, this is evil. It's this thing. That, that would be the first question to ask. Is it a thing? Well, when someone thinks an evil thought and then does something evil, then it becomes a thing. Somebody's murdered, that's a thing. But what does the scripture say about this? Did God create evil? Well, evil, I would say, is more the absence of good it's the absence of good God didn't create it in fact he allowed for it but he did not create it he allowed for it to exist because of his sovereign perfect plan to allow for free will and for us to turn our back away from God 
and evil came about. The psalmist says this, though, even darkness is light to you, Psalm 139, 12. Now, if that doesn't give you some mystery, I don't know what does. Even darkness is light to him. Psalm 5, 4, you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. So God being God does not delight in darkness. And James 1, 13 through 17 is another good one to go through that I, that I always have to remind myself when I'm thinking about this question. It says this, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. That tells me that we brought evil into this world. God did not create evil. He allowed for it. And why is even darkness light to him? Because he uses it for good in the end, for his glory, to display his glory. In fact, God's glory is displayed when he has mercy on us and he redeems us and he, and he reconciles us to, to him and he re regenerates us. His glory is displayed when we, when we display the fruits of the Spirit, when we love someone with this kind of love that Jesus has for us. That is God's glory. But here's a mystery. God's glory is going to be displayed in all things and it is seen in how he is glorified even in the destruction of the wicked. Even in the destruction of evil and the wicked, God's glory is displayed. Now, two verses on that that we need to compare with one another. Romans 9, 22 through 23 says this. What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy which he has prepared beforehand for glory? Now there's some mystery for you. God will show his glory in dealing with evil. And do you ever watch a documentary or a cold case or something where somebody got away with murder, with something really evil, and you just want to step into the story and just take justice into your own hands. This guy murdered a child. I want to take him. I want to hang him. I'm so mad. But it's out of my control. There's justice. Justice needs to be served. Look at what this man did to this whole family. Yet, look at God. There's a perfect balance there. So he's going to show his wrath against evil, but there's also a balance. Ezekiel 33, 11 says this, Say to them, as I, Surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. There's some mystery there. God is going to display his glory when he has justice in this earth and when he returns, when he comes on that horse and, and, and he deals with all the evil that we see all the time and we are going to just praise his name and we are going to be so thankful that this world is going to be renewed. But even in that, there's a, there's a part of God that's like, I, I wish that it didn't have to be this way. Like, I don't like... I don't take pleasure in destroying the wicked like I would. Sometimes I feel like I would. The guy who murders a little girl or something, I would take some pleasure in smacking the guy around. But I'm fallen. God doesn't even take pleasure in that. Oh, the depths, the riches, and the knowledge of God. No one is like him. This world is going to get really bad. It's going to get wicked and more and more wicked, and men will become more and more lovers of themselves rather than lovers of God. There will be one world government set up underneath the control of the Antichrist. And saints, the saints will wonder, why God, how long? 
How long will you allow this to happen when we see all the bloodshed happening in this world? That's what happens in Revelation. They're like, God, why? What's taking so long? Deal with the evil in this world. And then in one single moment in Revelation 18, that great city of Babylon where people are enslaved and it's all about wealth and status and they think they're pretty something and they think nobody can touch them. In a single moment, God will wipe that city out like that and all of the saints will go wow wow I can't believe the power and the knowledge and the wisdom of God so even even the bad things will result in glory to God and praise for his perfect justice that he was patient notice that he is patient in his patience, he's waiting and waiting. It wasn't that he was quick to anger, very slow to anger, not wanting anyone to perish. But then, eventually, all will be dealt with and justice will be served and God will be glorified and Christ will reign as king on this earth. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you that you have had mercy on us. Lord, we're told that we can't even come to you unless you draw us. So Lord, even, even our response to you, we don't get the credit for. is because what you have done, you have saved us, you have redeemed us. Lord, we cannot puff up ourselves over anyone. Lord, help us to have the heart that you have for even the wicked, that we don't take pleasure. Because Lord, you look at that wicked person and you think, You've seen his whole life from a little child. Lord, you know that you created him, created her. Lord, this world has increasingly become wicked. Help us to have a heart of compassion as you did Jesus, as you looked out over Jerusalem. Lord, keep us humble. Keep us rooted, grounded in the gospel so that, Lord, our only boast is in you, King Jesus. In your name, amen.